my name is Richard Boudet, and yes, I'm from uh, Houston, also called Houston, where I come from. Um, but I was born in Riverdale, so I'm not a complete foreigner. I am. Uh, and I'm a developer of video games uh, for help. So what I'd like to do is kind of do this in two parts. I want to give you kind of a brief overview of the kind of work that we do. Uh, and then talk about the kind of work that you do or you might do given our uh, experience in this whole sort of thing. Um, first of all, let me tell you that I'm not a PhD, BDS, MD, anything. I'm a FAIA. I become an architect. I'm a building designer. So that's why I don't wear a tie. I'm a lucky, lucky that we were in the Our artsy types don't come from the ground up very much. Especially since my crew is really composed of uh, software developers, uh, programmers, uh, game uh, designers, uh, animators, writers, musicians, just a whole host of very non-scientific uh, kinds of disciplines. And, and that might explain the kind of thoughts you'll hear from me uh, today in the context of uh, health education. So we've been doing this 15, my practice is 30 years uh, old, we've been doing game for health primarily. The last building I touched was about 10 years ago. Primarily, the work we've been doing has been uh, developing uh, games for health care and for health education. Primarily for health care. Uh, we, uh, in every project, we partner with <coughs> academic uh, medical institutions of some kind. The Anna College of Medicine has been our primary uh, colleague, uh, scientific colleague in the work that we do. The University of Texas has also been part of that. Northwestern, I can list a whole bunch of uh, other uh, mostly uh, medical students uh, in the work that we've done over the years. Uh, but it's been a very interesting experience from my point of view, again, as an architect, who is on the outside in. Now, my wife is a physician. I was told not to show you my wild point on medical school. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I learned to talk the talk and sort of walk the walk in dealing with scientists and clinicians years ago. And that, that has helped me uh, in the work that we've done. Uh, in 2025, I, I did a recent calculation before I got it by close to $30 million. Uh, it's not been all ours. We've been PI for about a third of that. The rest we've been co-eyes or subcontractors, uh, mostly on our grants. The, the $10 million that we have been awarded have been SBIR grants. I'm familiar with NIH grant mechanisms, those are small business innovative research where you partner with a uh, academic institution. But ultimately, for the government, grants us money to do is to create products, to create new taxpayers, to create uh, wealth in, uh, in the country. And that's primarily how we've been funding uh, all the work that we do. The only reason I show you that number, and the only reason I, I mention this number, is because uh, you can see that you know games for health or health education are eminently fundable by NIH and NSF. So for researchers in, in, in the audience here, uh, consider this as, as, a, as a vehicle. You can just help you with other people. Uh, we're happy to talk to you about it. But the point is that the government is funding games for health. The work that we've done, as I said, has been primarily targeting uh, children and has been mostly focused on diet and nutrition. So there are some childhood obesity prevention, high two diabetes prevention video games. And you're going to probably wonder how we're going to get from games for kids to games for dental students. And there is a there is a part here you will hopefully see as I move along. One of the projects that we did is a, a website uh, for teaching children about uh, physical activity and nutrition it's called Play Normal. And PlayNormal.com is uh, it's probably about five years old now. It's still online. It's being used. Currently, during the uh, during school years, by hundreds of schools and actually hundreds of thousands of students, uh, K through high school, a very very wide age group, typically you don't find that level of game uh, appealing to such a wide age group. Uh, but parents are using it, and uh, uh, teachers are also using it. It uh, turned out to be very popular. In fact, we were asked to uh, create an installable version of the games for schools that don't allow their kids to free on the to, to get on the internet. So we have Mac and PC installable CD-ROM versions of the game. And there are also kiosks in Houston's two children's museums, uh, more or less on permanent uh, display. 
These games are also, we've reported them to uh, apps, so they're available on the uh, Apple App Store as iPod, I'm sorry, well, iPad, iPod, and uh, iPhone games as well. And in that uh, version, uh, players can earn uh, badges and rewards. They can check the leaderboard and compare how their status, how well they're doing in terms of points and achievements with uh, players all over the world. Now, this kind of feedback mechanism, being able to report points and achievements and check off accomplishments, is a very important part of gamification. It's part of the motivation for playing is the ability to say, I have achieved something, or I'm better than you, I'm better than you. They're multilingual, Spanish and English. Now we've also created what you might think of, how many games, how many people play games? Okay. Oh, well, it's a smattering, like a third or less. We also created games that look more like console games, maybe your children or your grandchildren play. The Nintendo, the PlayStation, the Xbox, those are called core video games and they're played on dedicated consoles. We've created games like that. And I'm going to show you a trailer for one. The purpose of this again is to show you the kind of scope and scale that uh, some of the work that we're doing uh, cover. This is the town of Dyer. So how many of those vending machine towers are there? A lot. A few blocks? Yeah. You can eat all the junk food you want. Team Edie's wants to make sure no one is ever very far from the food. In Daya, you can never have to exercise. I've seen some decent fruits and vegetables. How many people eat that? The food in the vending towers is free. Ah, sounds like a dream? It's not. It's a nightmare. Join DJ, Belinda, Deegan, Bears Paul, and Miser. It's up to you to help our heroes defeat the tyrannical King Etes and escape from Diab. So the purpose of the game is to reduce the incidence of child uh, obesity. This targets 10 to 12 year old uh, children. Uh, we tested it, that game and a companion game called Nano Swarm in a uh, fairly, in, in, I'll call it a medium sized clinical study. Uh, we now are uh, testing it in a much larger uh, study, uh, efficacy and, uh, and likability and effectiveness studies. And we were able to demonstrate uh, in the first study uh, an increase of uh, a whole serving of vegetables and fruit a day over baseline. And that sounds pretty modest, five a day, we got 20% of the way there, but in, it's as good or better than anybody has uh, reported in the intervention, in the dietary intervention literature so far. So it's been, um, a slow kind of a progress. This game now is about eight years old, uh, but we think we're moving in the right direction. There does seem to be something effective there in terms of changing behavior. 
We also create games for adults. This, my comfort zone um, was for MD Anderson Hospital. Uh, and it isn't a game per se, although it looks a little bit like a game. It's actually a decision support tool for men recently diagnosed with prostate cancer. And the way that it works, it's designed to be prescribed by a physician to a patient uh, who has just been informed that he is uh, early uh, stage of prostate cancer. And uh, you play it at home, the patient with a significant other. Uh, it presents four different uh, treatment options, all of which have the same survival rate but vastly different uh, side effects. And uh, you basically pull a lever, spin a dial, and cards uh, come up depending on the treatment option uh, that you've selected to, uh, to explore. And these cards represent uh, st statistically accurate uh, predictions of what might uh, ex you experience as a side effect two months and, and uh, two years down the road and you rate each card and you can probe and ask, drill down and, and get more information about it as you go through it. And after you've played it four times, after you've gone through each treatment option, the game gives you a score and it says based on the feedback you've given me, I think you're going to be most comfortable with this course of treatment. And this information then gets sent back to the uh, physician and upon your next vision, visit, he sees the questions you flagged and the choices you've made and the issues that you've had with different side effects and you can have an informed discussion now about what sort of plan to, to undertake and that's better than just handing out pamphlets to the uh, patient say which would you like to do. We can operate, we can do nothing, we can so forth and so on. This is a game also for adults. It looks like a child's game. It, it resides in, this one is currently in production, uh, on an iPhone or an iPad. And this is a game to train mothers of four to five year old children on authoritative food parenting techniques. So it's a game to train parents on how to get their kids to eat. Uh, there's knowledge delivery and also behavior change mechanisms going on. And the idea of the game is that you have a child living in a virtual home on your phone or iPad, four to five year old child. You can select the gender, you can select the ethnicity, and you can select the temperament of the child. <laughs> Uh, and we as game developers are trying to move you from one of the four basic parenting types, neglectful, indulgent, authoritarian, to the author uh, authoritative model through gameplay. Uh, and your goal is to uh, take uh, this child who hates fruits and veggies using a fully functional kitchen and a grocery store and learn uh, effective authoritar uh, authoritative parenting techniques to negotiate successfully to improve the diet of your child. That's underway right now. Uh, and I'm getting close to the end of this sort of brief survey. This is a game for middle and high schoolers uh, that's used in school. We did this for, with Rice University. Uh, it's uh, basically you take on the role of a kid scientist dealing with the impending demise of Earth about to be struck by a doomsday asteroid and you have to research, develop and build an arc for all the major biomes so that a small group of Earthlings can escape to Mars and establish a toehold over there. And that's proving pretty effective. It's mostly for STEM education, science, technology, engineering, math. But you have to take biomes the entire range from bacteria to, to large animals. And finally we created uh, a game, an interactive novel that exists both in print and in ebook form uh, used uh, at the University of Texas now and other institutions uh, to teach health profession ethics to incoming dental, medical, nursing, so forth, public health uh, students. So, briefly, we create, we have created over the last 15 years uh, games for disease prevention, a little bit of treatment, decision support, health profession education, a very wide, uh, very broad scope of games or gamification of concepts that typically don't lend themselves or people haven't thought about in terms of gameplay. And in those 15 years we've learned something that I like to sort of get up on a soapbox and talk about to folks like yourselves and that's really what the next part of this conversation uh, is about. Games or gamification is a fairly new term. It, I think really the, the, the term serious, has anybody heard the term serious games before? Okay, but you've heard gamification. Uh, 
Gamification is a term that seems to have appeared recently. This is a plot of a usage over the internet, how many times someone types in gamification. And you can see in somewhere around 2010 it's been spiking up. But in actuality, uh, it appeared first, ironically enough, maybe in 1984. Anybody remember the book, right? Uh, in, a game, in a book about play and business. It was, uh, game and work, play and work, it, is, it was a, book, a, a business book. But it has taken on a life of its own, and so the question now is how to use it. Should we use it? Are there benefits? Are there opportunities in educating uh, dentists or any kind of health care provider? Or indeed, are there benefits in using it for health care, as we have been researching it? So let's talk about why why gamification? Why is it even on the, on, on the uh, discussion table right now? The video game industry is big business. It's, it's sort of the elephant in the room that nobody can ignore anymore. Uh, and, and these are 2012 dollars. The, the 2014 or 13 numbers are, are not uh, totally uh, easy to get your hand uh, around. But you can see that in 2012 it was bigger than the music or the movie industry. The rumor is that now it is bigger than both of the other, those other two industries combined. So it's huge, absolutely huge. So that's one reason to say, well, if everybody, or if, if it's that big a business, maybe there's something there we should look at. So just a question to the audience here, how many, I, I've already polled the, you know, a smattering of people who regularly play video games. What would you guess, if I were to ask you, of the entire uh, uh, U.S. population, children and adults, what percentage do you think regularly play video games? Throw out a number. 80? 80. 70? 60. 60. Oh, you win. You win. It's 58 percent. It's very, very good. But it's most of the population. It's 60 percent, and it's growing. Uh, it's not surprising. If you think about the relationship between video games and, and age, the average age video game player is an adult, 30 years old. And these are regular. These are not, I played it once because I have a son or a grandson. These are regular players, 30 years old. Interestingly enough, everybody recognize Pong, the first video game. You remember the two paddles and the silly little thing you threw quarters in maybe when you were in college like I did? That game is 36 years old. Notice that the largest segment of uh, population playing video games are also 36 and older. So this is the first generation, the 30-somethings, who never knew life before video games. It just has been part of the framework. That's why it is such a natural opportunity. That's one of the reasons why it's a natural opportunity to get to where people expect their information to come from. But also look at the other segments it's pretty well equally divided between young, middle, and older age groups. So all of this is uh, one way to say, in addition to the fact that, ooh, colors are a bit weird, but uh, it's almost evenly divided male and, and female. It's not just 18-year-old boys playing video games in their room. But all of this is to say that you can argue, I would argue, that video games are today's dominant form of mass communication. It's superseded newspapers, uh, maybe even superseding uh, the, the browser, Googling as, as a mass communication device. Um, and if it's not superseding television, uh, or it probably has superseded television and newspapers, it may or may not be superseding the, the internet yet, but it, it's, it's big. It's very, very big. And therefore, it commands attention if you're an educator talking to this demographic. It has some interesting um, characteristics similar to other forms, uh, dominant forms of mass communication. One is it's intrinsically uh, motivated. People don't have to be assigned a video game to play it. They willingly play it. They spend a lot of $21 billion a year to acquire games to play. So they are self-motivated to play a video game. And they are spending phenomenal amounts of time playing video games. Today, a 21-year-old will have spent the same amount of time, if they've had perfect attendance, going to middle and high school as playing video games. So if you're trying to think of ways to get to the eyeballs of people, 
video games is equal to go sitting in a classroom in a chair getting didactic education. It's hard to ignore. Another attribute worth noting is its immersive qualities, like a movie, like a novel. When you are playing a video game, you suspend naturally, automatically suspend your disbelief. You do not counter argue against the story being told. If you're swept up in a Spielberg movie or a Stephen King novel or a video game, you are one with the game. It's a perfect, if you will, brainwashing opportunity. <laughs> now here's where it pulls ahead of other media. You get instant feedback. You learn through experience, trial and error. You discover very quickly what works, what doesn't work. So here's the opportunities of using video games as an educational medium. People want to get their hands on your course if it's delivered through a video game. They're willing to invest huge amounts of time on their own initiative. They will believe anything you tell them within the context of the, of the game world. They will be able to self-discover, use experiential learning, not just didactic learning, to get the messages that you would like to get across. And they're active participants. They're not sitting as you are right now, you know, trying to digest lunch, trying to absorb this, and not fall asleep. You know, they are actively engaged. It's a lot like walking around the streets of New York. You're either, uh, you know, on top of your game or you're going to get run over by a car or pushed off somehow or another. So you have to be alert. And these kinds of qualities are very important. In fact, we seem to be as a species intrinsically uh, or inherently um, predisposed to get information, important information, through gameplay. War games have been around as long as there have been warfare. Serious games, gamification of serious uh, tasks is nothing new. It's as old as the human species. It's just been brought up to date with virtualization. And a war game is a sense a virtualization of a much more serious event as well. The only difference is that you can't get really run over by a tank and uh, you know, pay the price of uh, physical harm. And in fact, that's why we are drawn to games as we are drawn to movies, as we are drawn to any kind of uh, immersive storytelling, is because we, are, we know genetically that it's much better to learn about life in a safe virtual environment than to go through the school of hard knocks and find out the hard way. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So we are programmed to seek out novels and movies and stories, basically, and games to learn about life. It's a natural uh, instinct. And people are looking at this and saying, yeah, that means that we should think about using this as a tool in school. Wouldn't it be great to have the same behaviors that people employ in gameplay, persistence, risk taking, attention to detail, problem solving, in the classroom? Yes, it would be very good if we can find a way to direct that. Uh, this is from an interesting paper in MIT. I, I have a short uh, reference list at the end of this that uh, does talk about gamification in the context of education. But the idea here is also that unlike a lot of immersive media, and even active media, even in, 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 in physical games that you would play, like a sports, uh, a sport team, everybody can advance, it can be tailored to the player's interests and abilities. So not everybody has to be moving along the same path at the same time. This is another opportunity of games. And this has not gone unnoticed, um, gameplay and medicine, by uh, the scientific community. There have been studies that show good game players make good surgeons. There's something about their ability to react, their, uh, their, their quickness of thought, their tactile abilities, their ability to to ascertain three-dimensional you know, versus two-dimensional constructs that seem to have a direct role uh, in education, in medical education. So gamification is happening in a big way right now. I'm not here to tell you that it's working necessarily very well over all kinds of areas and disciplines, but a lot of people are looking to see, can it work? How could it work? Investigating it. Uh, the only area that I'm even half qualified to talk about are areas relating to health. 
in most of the areas uh, where my experience uh, applies are in prevention, treatment, a little bit of communications. To a certain extent, um, but to a more limited uh, uh, extent, education, uh, professional education. But I am going to talk about that uh, in a minute. I've been, I did a little survey of um, simulators, basically. Games that appear to have, that are being used in educating uh, uh, medical personnel. Uh, I don't know, has anybody ever seen this game, Pulse? Seen, all right. So this was developed by uh, uh, the Texas A&M uh, University at Corpus Christi for the U.S. Navy and the game developer called Breakaway Games. It is a triage and an emergency room simulator. First person role playing like a video game. You walk around, things are happening. You got to go to the equipment and touch the patient like a mannequin. It's a, it's a, it's a real clinical surgical triage simulator. Breakaway Games took that same game engine and working with the Medical College of Georgia, uh, created a dental implant training, uh, they call it a game, uh, that I think has been used before. Uh, the intent of both of these games are high fidelity. They, they're trying to replicate uh, environments and tools with the highest fidelity they can as a training device. There have been lower fidelity uh, attempts that I found out there. Uh, this is a dentistry simulator. It has, it's m more about uh, workflow and patient flow through a, de uh, a dentist's office uh, by uh, Aristotle University in Greece, Athens probably. And another one about denting and bonding for uh, Ohio State University. So there have been attempts at game-like uh, uh, training simulations. And if you look at the typology of video games, and this is just a very short look at it, but there's lots of kind of games and they, they, did, they tend to fall into genres. Action games, role playing games, and so forth. And simulator games is, are uh, a major part of it. These, the ones I just showed you tend to be clinical or operational simulator games. But I have a very strong belief, and this is where my 15 years of experience is kind of rearing its head, that the games I just showed you are not games. They're simulators. And there's a fundamental difference that unless you appreciate it, you're going to miss some of the opportunities that gamification offers. And what I mean by that is there are certain expectations by people when you tell them, especially today's generation, who again never knew life before games, when you tell them this is a game, when you attach the word game to anything, they expect a certain minimum uh, set of characteristics. Uh, if you look at just the di dictionary definition of a game, it says it's an activity, often in the form of a contest, uh, played according to certain rules for amusement, recreation, or for winning. So simple definition of what is a game. First of all, you have to be active. It's not a passive thing. You just can't sit in an audience and listen. So, Experiences that are not active are not games, and certainly simulators uh, fulfill this requirement. Games must have rules. No problem there. Most simulators, you can't just do anything you want. There are certain con uh, contexts and, and, and constraints that limit amount, uh, that what you can do. Here's where things start to fall apart. Here's where the difference between games and simulators that are not games sort of uh, diverge paths. Very few simulators are contests. In a game, it's usually a battle between one and an opposing force. Much like a story has got a protagonist and an antagonist working to, against the protagonist's goal. If you don't have a contest in the simulator, it's probably just more drill and practice than it is a true game. And so the breakaway games that I showed you it didn't really have the enemy trying to blow up the operating room in the middle of the battle and you had to sort of work around it. It was just first do this, first do that, then do this, and if you didn't do that right then you can't go on to step 12. So it's, it's drill and practice. And more important is the amusement side of it, fun. So the less uh, opposing forces you have, the more you are restricted to just following 
the recipe, the less game-like it feels. If you don't have fun, it's not a game. It's a very simple uh, construct. No fun, no gameplay. It's something else, but it's not a game. Now, why does that matter? Why should simulators, simulations be fun anyway? What does that buy you, if anything? This is a scene of a real uh, war game. No one is really being shot, but does this look like fun? Has anybody been in the military and participated in war games? It's 100 degrees outside, you're in a tank, live ammunition fl flying overhead, you're carrying 50 pounds on you, and you have a drill sergeant or somebody barking or screaming at you. This is not fun. This is a World War I flight simulator. The way this worked is it was basically a tin can on a gimbaled mount. They threw you in this little thing and they closed the hood so it was now pitch black. All you had was a rudder stick. And some guy with another stick in the back was just moving, yanking it all over the place. And you, your goal was to try to use the foot pedals to stabilize the thing. Uh, if you read about what pilots did as soon as this uh, simulator was over is that they got out and threw up. This was not fun either. This was drill and practice. This was a simulator. So they've grown up, they've become, become much more uh, realistic. They look like it would be fun to fly one of these things, but if you're a pilot and you do this for a living, this is not fun, this is work. All right. So. It may look like a game if it's a simulator, and some simulators are games. If, if you're flying around and you have an enemy dogfight and you can win and land successfully, then it is a game. There are points, there are badges, there are rankings and so forth. But if it's just put hours behind the yoke and try not to crash, there's really no gameplay going on. Simulators are used for training, not for fun. So all of these, and I'm going to suspect a lot of what's available to you now in the marketplace, are going to be simulators. They're not going to be games, which means that you are going to lose the opportunity of the first two characteristics of games, where people are intrinsically and self-motivated to play without being asked. They'll do it on their own. And you will lose the opportunity for them to <coughs> willingly invest huge amounts of time. That may or may not be important to you, but I call that out as, as something to think about because when you find students willing to spend more time than you had planned on an educational opportunity, there are benefits. And I'm gonna, uh, I'd like to illustrate that um, point uh, by way of example. We created for the uh, University of Texas, in conjunction with the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston, uh, several years ago, um, a game. And it was a game about health profession ethics. So as you probably know, um, there are six health professional schools at uh, UT Health, medical, dental, bioinformatics, public health, there are six, nursing. And, uh, and I think Dr. Valenza was here last year speaking to the crowd. UT is very, very progressive in its thinking. We work a lot with Baylor College of Medicine and they're not as progressive as UT. It's, I hope nobody here is a Baylor alum of some kind or another. Uh, I'm very impressed with the, uh, with the vision and the visioning that, that UT Health seems to have inherent in, in, in its Houston campus. But they recognized in 2009 uh, a need for uh, a better approach to teaching ethics, a coordinated approach across all of the health profession schools. Uh, and there was no lack of um, impetus, there was no lack of uh, issues to address. Some of them uh, had to do with practice and research, but many of them had to do with just being a student, cheating, plagiarizing, and so forth. These were issues that they wanted to address in a way that they weren't uh, able to do uh, previous. They literally wanted to get out of the uh, mode of just covering the material to changing the behavior of incoming health profession students. They want to imprint health ethics inside the core identity of incoming students because they know very well that it's not going to be likely that 20 years from now 
the Nazis will be back, and the same issues that dealt with their, that they saw in their lectures in 1938 will rear its head again. They're going to be much more fuzzy, much more gray. And so what we would like to do is have them instinctively know what to do, not say, well, this is just like that, not find an algorithm and say, well, if it's this, do that. If it's something else, do something else. So the way it was being taught, I don't know how ethics is, are being taught here uh, at the time, was through case histories. Auditorium, PowerPoint lecture, bullet point slides, consider the case of such and such happening. You're back in row 50. You're quite removed sort of uh, cognitively and emotionally from the scene, and you're going to remember this just long enough to pass the test. It's passive learning, didactic learning. And if you look at the scores uh, in, taken in, 19, in 2009 of how much, how well it was working, you can see it's under 50%. So post-testing, they were about halfway up the scale of students knowing the ethics issues uh, that they ha would like them to know. So we created a game, and this is the game. It's called a game book. But it works just like a video game, and it's, there's e-versions as well as paper versions of it. We created a story, a, a medical novel, a drama, the kind of thing you would go to the bookstore and buy off the shelf. Plus, it's called The Brewsters. And it's called The Brewsters because it's about a family whose last name is Brewsters. There's Wayne Brewster whose mother, Gloria, has oral cancer. Wayne is a hypochondriac, He's convinced he has osteoporosis. His son is a medical student who winds up in his first year in medical school drunk all the time, partying, can't really get his act together. And his wife is having an affair. And he's dealing with this and dealing with his care providers are, are dealing with all these family issues. And you take on the role, as a reader, of one or more characters in the story. You choose your point of view character, and you choose what happens to this character throughout the story, a lot like a video game. It's a first-person role-playing uh, interactive uh, narrative. And I don't know whether you can see this, but you can see it's written in second person. You do this. Someone walked in the room and talked to you. It's not third person. It's, not for, it's second person, which is not easy to write narrative for, by the way. And you creative writers in here will, will, will tell you that that's the last. No fiction author in their right mind would write in second person. But we did. And at the end of many scenes, there's a decision point. You decide what page to turn to next. And that forks the story. There are three acts. In the first, and in, in, in each act, you pick a different point of view character. So in act one, you can pick a, either a, a man or a woman medical student. In the second act, you can pick a nursing student or, or Walter, the patient family member who thinks he has osteoporosis, dealing with the crisis of his wife having an affair, his mother having oral cancer. Or you can play in the third act a dental student who was assigned to a research project gone awry, uh, or the patient. And through all of these different point of views, you see the same events happen, but from different perspectives. And you make decisions based on that perspective. Other characters, non-point of view characters, are pretty much cover the whole range that you might expect in any kind of a drama like this. There are physicians, there are attorneys, um, there's a dental hygienist who sort of plays a hero character in the story. Uh, there is a, their IRB gets involved. Uh, there's pharmaceutical reps. All kinds of ethical issues show up between these characters and the point of view characters. In between each act are didactic chapters, what you might expect in a textbook. And so in act, and, and they deal directly with the scenes that you just read through. So we're dealing with self-regulation due to report, misleading titles, and professionalism. And we don't go down the list. It's all the ethical issues that you might expect. Choose Your Own Adventures are a very interesting uh, literary genre. They go back to the 60s and 70s. Anybody here ever read a Choose Your Own Adventure novel? One. Just one. Did you like it? Did you like it? It was a long time ago. 
they usually were very poorly written. They were really more interested in, isn't it cool that we can have 25 different endings? And you can die in these endings. But basically, it's a work of fiction that allows the reader to participate in the story by making choices. And if you look at the story flow, the plot diagram, you'll see that it branches all over the place. And so there's, no, there, there's many, many endings, depending on the choices that you take. And you can die and go back again to that page and, and pick another ending and, uh, or another option and see if you get it right this time. Ours was not quite as com convoluted or complicated uh, as that. This is the uh, plot flow for Act One of the Brewsters. And as you can see, maybe, there, it, it's sort of a, it forks right at the beginning. You decide whether you want to be Gerald, um, Cheryl, or John, the medical student. And then the parallel stories begin. You're all witnessing similar scenes from different perspectives. But different, thing happens, different things happen to you as you go through the story. And in the end, you wind up in the same spot so that the next act can continue from that point forward. So how did we do? After students read this as their first health profession ethics course compared to the classical means of doing it, the, the, the point scale changed. But after you normalize them, we basically doubled the understanding of, of health ethics. We went from below 50% to almost 80 or 90%. This has been a dramatic improvement. And I think the reason for that is the fact that it was fun. So here are student comments from surveys at the end of the course. And I'll just sort of pick and choose a few of them here. But look at what students are saying. I found myself picking the wrong sequence to follow and then realizing my mistake and why it was wrong. The story tricks you into learning. They liked that. This is stealth education. They're not overtly aware that somebody is trying to teach them something. The shields are down. The counter arguing is not going on in their head. Why should I know this? Why do I care? They're beyond all that. They do care. They care so much that we sat in a dental class with two actors representing Gloria and Wayne Brewster. Not, we never told them the, the, the characters in the story were made up. They were fictional. The incidents that happen in here are based on real events, but in a sense, it's a total work of fiction. So we brought them into the classroom, and the students who had read the book were totally empathetic. Gloria, how's your oral cancer coming along? I know you'll do fine. Please don't give up. And Wayne, how's that drinking problem? They were dealing with them like real people. And when we told them at the end that uh, these are actors, they're actually writers, too. They actually wrote the parts, but they're actors. The students were incensed. They were angry. I thought somebody was going to throw a chair. They had invested their emotions so grandly with these characters that they were uh, upset that they had been tricked. Then they cooled off and things were better. One student said, this is like Hippocrates meets US mag or Us magazine. Right? There are some scenes in there dealing with uh, sexual harassment. There's no sex in it, but it kind of uh, you know, suggests something's going on. It's some hanky-panky. They love that. That was appealing to them. And it had to, all to do, everything to do with ethics. And they found it was cathartic to make the wrong choice. It's like getting out of your system. I love to be naughty, as long as I don't get caught. I saw myself getting into character and asking myself, what would I do in this situation? Well, you can't ask for a better reaction to a, a better teaching moment than that. I love the interactive nature of the book. Uh, it kept me turning the pages. Interestingly enough, it was designed for a four-hour read. We didn't want this to go, you know, be very often, uh, some of the each school implemented it in a different way. Some of them uh, wrought, read it during the summer before they sort of matriculated and others did it right away. But we didn't want it to be too long a read. And we knew if you tried to go through every path and read every character's point of view, it would take you a long time. I don't have the statistic, but I want to say the majority of, of, uh, of students read it at least three times. They went back and read it as a different point of view character to get a different perspective. And some of them read it, they took every path just to see what would happen. Now how many textbooks on anything are read three or six or nine times because the student wanted it to read it. It was enjoyable. I don't think many. 
you are actually eager to turn the page and keep reading. This is one of the only books in school you'll ever read where you actually want to keep reading and turn the page. I couldn't have asked for better blurbs. <laughs> totally un, unwritten by us. You always learn better after taking the wrong or right decision. So anyway, this shows you the effect fun can have in an educational uh, experience. And I thought this was the best. Pinocchio had Jiminy Cricket. And now the health professions have the Brewsters. Now, do you all remember Jiminy Cricket? Do you remember that character? Do you know the role he played in the movies? He was Pinocchio's conscience. He was the little guy who sat on Pinocchio's shoulder and says, no, 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 right? Isn't that exactly what you, we wanted to do with uh, the health ethics issues here? We wanted to imprint on them. We wanted a little bell to be able to go off in their head 20 years down the road when something comes up and they go, gee, I'm not sure what to do. I think, I instinctively think I ought to do this versus that. So this, if this is true, and I hope that it is, was exactly what we wanted to do. Build ethics directly into uh, students' identity. Okay, I'm going to wrap up there.